We now go to item 108, receiving a report from the Bridge Center for Hope by the chair. Is there anyone here wishing to speak on an item? I would ask for, uh, for those who are here to wishing to speak on item 108, uh, you wait until after the report has been completed and then uh, make your comments at that time. So at this time, if there is anyone here uh, who is going to present the report on item 108, we ask that you come forward at this time. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Before I speak, um, I want to give our board chair a moment to address the council, if that's okay. Okay. Is that going to be part of your, yes. your presentation? Yes, okay. sir, it is. So our chair is um, Patrick Sider behind me. Thank you, Charlotte. I just uh, won't take uh, but one minute of your time because I wanted to let you know that on behalf of the uh, board of directors of the Bridge Center, uh, the organization is not going anywhere. I mean, this is good timing for us that we have an opportunity to report to the Metro Council because I believe there's been some media attention. Um, and so this is a good opportunity for us to set the record straight that the board is firmly committed to the Bridge Center for Hope. Uh, we are firmly committed to our partner, RI International. Um, they're doing a terrific job with the center. Um, You'll hear they are facing some financial challenges as a result of some uh, state funding issues, but we're really working diligently to work through those. We've made some excellent progress just in the past few days, and I'm optimistic um, that we're going to be able to get over those hurdles and receive the funding that the center needs to, uh, to continue to provide the services at the level um, that uh, the, the city parish expects. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Charlotte to give you an update on where we are. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to echo the sentiments that our board chair, um, Mr. Sider, said is the fact that the Bridge Center for Hope is the first crisis stabilization center in the state of Louisiana. And a lot of people understand that when you are a pioneer and when you go first, you're going to have to forge ahead and pave the way. And that's what we're doing. We're paving the way for crisis care in this state so that everybody can receive it going forward. And if we have to keep on crossing obstacles and hurdles and barriers to do that, then that's what we're going to do. Because what we understand is that mental health and substance use does not discriminate. And everyone in this room can be affected by it, either directly or indirectly. So we are not closing. I need to make sure that everyone understands that we are not closing. We are still providing the same crisis services that we have always provided since the doors opened on February the 11th, 2021. Ready? So since the Bridge Center opened, um, we have served 4,374 individuals within the state. And I say state because we have served over 31 of the 64 parishes. But keep in mind that the dedicated tax funding that our East Baton Rouge Parish residents have given is only going toward EBR residents. It does not go to outer parish residents. So I need to make sure that's clear as we go forward. We've admitted 4,163 individuals in the first 18 months. Um, this does not include September, but it goes from February 11th to August 30th of this year. Of that, 3,591 are East Baton Rouge Parish residents. Next. I believe at the last meeting that we had, someone wanted to know what our admission source was. And so on this chart or this graph, about 51% of the individuals who come to the Bridge Center that are admitted are self. They come in as walk-ins directly. 33% are first responders and EMS, because I have them grouped together. And our first responders is all of law enforcement within the parish and our emergency medical services. 11% of the people who are brought to the Bridge Center come with a family or a friend. And 3% are referred from our local hospitals and the other 2% are other. Next. This slide represents the breakdown of the first responders because I know that when we initially talked to the parish about the Bridge Center for Hope, we said this, this would be a diversion for law enforcement and then also an alternative to the emergency room department. So 
Of that, 1,387 were brought in um, by first responders, and this is for this year. No, I'm sorry. This is for the whole entire 18 months. Um, 651 were Baton Rouge Police Department. 354 were from the Sheriff's Office. 352 were from EMS. And 30 were from out other um, agencies like probation and parole, Zachary Baker Central, and so forth. And then the average handle time is 3.36 minutes. And that is significant because when we initially talked about coming to the facility, being an easy place for law enforcement to drop someone off. We thought it was going to take anywhere between five to 10 minutes, because if you go to the emergency room, it can take 30 minutes to several hours. Well, what we've done and what we've accomplished is outstanding and amazing in its own, in its own right, because we have been able to get law enforcement and EMS in and out of the facility under five minutes. Next slide. This next slide represents the top zip codes in East Baton Rouge Parish. What I've noticed is that the most of the individuals that frequent the facility are within a 10 mile radius, with the highest being the 70806 zip code, and that accounts for a little bit over 300 individuals. Um, partly, I think, and this is just me speculating, I think a lot of it is the dealing with transportation and in terms of people who are in out of, out of line areas are having issues with transportation. So that is something that we will be working on towards to be able to help those individuals who need services to get to the facility if need be. Next slide. This chart represents the demographics. So of the individuals who are admitted to the facility, 73% of them are male, 27% are female, 53% are black, 38% are white, 6% are no entry, um, we're working on that, and then 2% are Asian. Next slide. Within the facility, when individuals come for services, they can either come for a mental health or a co-occurring or substance use. And when I say co-occurring, those are individuals who are dual diagnosed. They have a mental health and a substance use component. So when we talk about that substance use, it's not just 100% substance use. That includes the co-occurring individuals as well. So that number may seem a little high to some people who think that we are just a drug facility. That is not the case. We do provide mental health services for those individuals because of our licensing type. It's for people who have a high acuity level and a substance use issue. So when you're talking about that substance, you kind of kind of think about dual diagnosis. So of that, um, in 2022, 33% of the individuals who come to the facility are being treated for alcohol. 26% are being treated for opioid and cocaine is 24%. Um, Earlier today, we did recognition for Tanja Miles, and this month is Suicide Prevention Month. And I want to say that in August of this year, the Bridge Center for Hope had the highest one-month total that we've ever had at 354 individuals. And more than half of those were for substance use. And that's for the groundwork that organizations like hers have done to make sure that individuals know that we are there and that we're always there to help. Throughout the facility, there is about... Um, a 47% of individuals come in for strictly mental health and then 48% are substance use. And that chart represents the overall 18 months. Next slide. When we talk about dispositions, we talk about your discharge. Um, everyone who leaves the facility is discharged with a behavioral health appointment and a physical health appointment because of what we, I've said this over and over. If you're Physical health, you're not going to be worried about your physical health if you're not worried about your mental health. And so we need to be able to do both. So this right here represents the top dispositions or discharges of the facility based on unit. For the 23-hour observation unit, um, number one is 34% at our short-term psychiatric, which means they were transferred to our other unit for additional services. Number two is medical detoxification. That means they were transferred to our detox unit for additional services. Three is medical, um, against medical advice. Those are individuals who decided they didn't want further treatment after they had gone through a safety screener. So what I mean by that is nobody's leaving the facility if they're not safe. Uh, we talk about that all the time, and I know people see AMA. 
at our facility, our, sir, our provider is not going to let anyone leave without being going through a safety screener. So if they're choosing to leave against medical advice, they are sound mind at that point. And then number four is 10% is home. For our short term, that is our 16 bed psychiatric unit. 31% was discharged, went home. 22% went to a homeless shelter. And that's significant because we are right down the street from St. Vincent de Paul. So we do see a lot of those individuals, but that 22% is not a lot in terms of when we look at the whole entire 4,000. Um, it's more than what it should be, but it, it's still a, a, a relatively small number. And then 19% for substance use, 17% for group home. And then for the medical detoxification, it's 48% individuals went to a 28-day residential program, meaning that once they left our facility, they continued their services through a residential program or a 28-day program. 23% um, were left against medical advice, meaning they just wasn't ready, and that's okay. We're here. They're human, but we're always open, so they can always come back. And then 19% home and... 7% half a house. You have to forgive me because these, this is very little. Next slide. So I think a lot of people want to know about the funding source. I think that was the main point that a lot of people wanted to know is well, how is the Bridge Center doing? When the Bridge Center again was first started, it really was to, we knew that 70% of the population would be Medicaid. We understood that. And so that tax passage was, was supposed to help that indigent population. But keeping in mind when the Bridge Center opened, there was no crisis services in the entire state and there was no reimbursement rate for crisis services in the state. So we've been working very, very hard for the last 18 months to not only get crisis service rates in the state, but once they did imp or implement it this year, we, they're still significantly low. And so we're still working hard to be able to raise that amount for the cost of care to provide these services. So when we look at this chart and we look at the funding source, 77% of the recipients that come to the Bridge Center are Medicaid. 21% are uninsured. Of that 21, when we break it down, 81% are East Baton Rouge Paris residents. That is what the Bridge Center covers, that 81% of the uninsured. And 19% are out of parish. 1% are Medicare and 1% are commercial. Next slide. This is the financial breakdown of the Bridge Center for Hope since we've started receiving funding in 2020. I know that the tax passed in 2018. We spent all of 2019 collecting that tax and then we didn't get our first allocation until January of 2020. If you can see on the slide, it's about $6.5 million. We have a contract with our service provider, RI International, that has a contract max at $5.8 million. So anything over $5.8 million is something that goes toward our, our provider. If you look at the chart, you will see that right now the Bridge Center has $3.7 million in assets. We're, we still have funding to be able to provide for our residents in East Baton Rouge Parish. Next slide. I know that there was some media attention that we're seeing that we were bleeding cash. The Bridge Center for Hope, the nonprofit, again, as I showed you before, is three, we have $3.7 million in assets. But that story was misleading. And the reason why it was misleading is because our service provider, RI International, came here with the understanding that we would get funding through Medicaid for those Medicaid individuals that receive care at the services. They operated all of 2001, 2021 without any funding. They did not close. They did not leave. They did not shut the doors. They continued to provide services for the individuals here in East Baton Rouge Parish in spite of not having a reimbursement structure in place. Part of the reason why they are $5.1 million in the red it's because, again, if you look at this chart, there was no established Medicaid rates for crisis services during year one of the operations. They didn't have the ability to access um, Medicaid, the Medicaid provider portal. And what that means is they were not able to look to see 
if that person who came into the facility had Medicaid, they were not able to look in that in the um, the portal to look to see where that person had been. They just got they just got access today after 18 months of trying. And then also the last caveat to this is when Medicaid rates were implemented in the state in March of 2022, they're significantly low, and you'll see that by the next slide. Next slide. This is the cost of care. For our 23-hour observation unit, it costs a roughly an estimate of $1,142.86 per day per person. The Medicaid rate is $478.56, leaving them a difference of $664.30 for them to have to figure out. If you look at the crisis stabilization, that is that 16-bed unit that we have. The cost of care for that is $855.26, and the Medicaid reimbursement rate is $664.67, a difference of $190.59. And then when we look at medical detoxification services, it's $880 a day per person, and the Medicaid reimbursement rate is $333.50 leaving a difference of $467.30. Those differences are going to our provider, not to the East Baton Rouge Parish public, but to the provider. Next slide. This breaks down our provider's financial overview. If you look at it, it tells you that they are, and at the little screens in a way, but it's, it's a negative $5.1 million. It averages about $12 million a year to operate a crisis center such as what we have. Again, our contract max is 5.8. Medicaid is supposed to cover their, their population or their clients, and the Bridge Center covers the indigent population. So if we can't get the rates raised, if we can't get those services closer to the cost of care, no one is going to be able to provide adequate services in East Baton Rouge Parish. But that is something, again, when I stated we are pioneers, that is what we're trying to do, not just for us, but for every crisis provider that is going to come behind us. Next slide. One of the things that the, was in the media was that we were laying off people. So let me be clear with that. In order to continue mental health and substance use services and align the facility with the current funding while still maintaining the ability to accept all referrals in real time, our, our service provider had to right size the overall program. It, has, it had 140 staff members. Of that 140 staff members, um, I believe 21 were affected. 11 of those were RI employees and 10 were contract workers. So the Bridge Center still has 120 employees at the facility providing care at the service. So it's a 13% reduction. And what we also did so that we could be finance for our service, or for our provider to be sustainable was to consolidate two units. So what we've done is we've taken our detoxification unit and our crisis stabilization, and we have combined those two. So we're still providing all of the services that we said that we were going to provide. If anyone remember, when we were talking about the Bridge Center initially, the facility was going to be a lot smaller than what it actually is. It was supposed to be an eight-bit crisis facility for eight for psychiatric, eight for detox. We moved it to 16 for um, detox, 16 for crisis, and then we also included another 16 for chairs. So we're still operating with more than what we initially funded for when we came to the city parish. Next slide. So I want to reiterate some things. Number one, the facility, again, is not closing. I do not know how to stress that more than I can right now is we're not closing. We're not curtailing services. We are providing the same mental health and substance use services that we have always provided. We are 24 hours, seven days a week. We do not need a referral to access care. The only criteria is you have to be 18 years of age and older. We still do involuntary and voluntary admissions at the facility. Next slide. And then the last slide is, again, I keep saying that over and over that we're open, and I say that because people think that we're closed and we're not. 
Um, and that people think that we are not providing detoxification services, but we still are. Um, we are still covering only East Baton Rouge Parish residents, regardless if they come in from Ascension, we're still covering our residents. And then lastly, um, the Bridge Center provider, I can't see what that thing says because her face is in the way, but that's okay. <laughs> but I think oh, we're operating the same with the same facility as, as we always have. So that's it. Thank you. We're going to uh, have the public hearing at this time. Is there anyone here wishing to speak on the item? I have Tanja Miles is here wishing to speak on item 108. Ms. Miles? Ms. Miles has, uh, doesn't want to speak. Is there anyone else wishing to speak on item 108? Come on down, Reverend Anderson. State your name and address for the record, please, ma'am. Although I know it. Reverend Alexis Anderson, 248 Steel Boulevard, 70806. Um, Good evening. As you know, this has been near and dear to my heart since its inception. And I have had great concern from the beginning. The Bible says who would build a building without first considering the cost. And I pointed out at the time that I had great concern about not just the planning, not just the blueprint, but the implementation. Because what this parish in fact passed was a mental health stabilization tax. And an entity that literally did not exist was given money to go build something. And so every single time there has been a report, I have been here because nobody cares about this issue more than the citizens of this parish. The number one call I get is from families saying, why do I have to go through the jail system or the court system to get help? And I have asked for specific data time after time after time from the baseline of when we pass the tax and hand it over money, I want to know everybody that came in there. I want to know the diagnose, diagnostic codes that have to be billed out. I want to know where those folk end up because I can tell you, as I've told you from time and time again, I'm sitting in the court and I can tell you where a lot of those folk are ending up. And it's not a good thing. We had a system in 2012 that worked. It was the M here. And that was the model. And we did not do that. And then we had a list of things that were told to us, and I have a printout of it, of what we were going to have, who was going to do what, and what we were going to staff. We didn't say anything about 12 parishes. We said we were going to give you $6 million, and we wanted something that was effective, that would be a diversion, that would serve the crisis mental health needs of this parish. And we expected the same level of accountability and transparency that was asked of our library system, that was asked of our uh, Council on Aging. And instead, every single report has been most beautiful. Mm -hmm. But what it has not been is a point to point. It has not been where my tax dollars are going. It has not been the explanation of, quite frankly, you got a partner that's got an issue. And when they don't have any money and they pack up their stuff, what are they going to do? Are they coming back to the taxpayers asking to make up that shortage? Because the answer is no. I ask at the time whether or not we as a parish could, in fact, take our money and put it into Capital Area Human Services if this plan did not work, as Charlotte said so eloquently, they are building it as they go. Our families don't have time for that. We have to be good stewards. And I am asking this council to do the hard work of saying, what is the plan? What is the plan? Not just to right the ship economically. 
What is the plan to make sure that programmatic Reverend costs? Anderson, Reverend Anderson, I'll let you go over two minutes. If somebody else wants to allow you to come back up, they can, but I'm gonna let these other folks speak. Sure. And then if any one of the council members wanna allow you to come back up during that time, they can. All Not right. a problem. But I gave you two extra minutes, Reverend Anderson, because you're here every week. <laughs> gave you two extra minutes. Anybody else wishing to speak on item 108, please come down. Good evening. Um, it's been a long time. Nice to see all of you. I'm Jennifer Harding. Um, I'm here today, um, very rushed to get here since you moved this item up. So um, I'm a little bit flustered, but I'll try to uh, be coherent. Um, I'm here on behalf of the organization I work for called Voice of the Experienced, um, also known as VOTE. Um, the, the word experience in the name of our organization refers to the experience of incarceration. Our, we represent a member base of uh, formerly incarcerated people, families of currently incarcerated people, and um, the people who support and love them. And uh, we have been engaged on this issue with the Bridge Center from the beginning. Um, we, when the tax passed with such overwhelming support, we were excited to see that um, overwhelmingly 68% of the voters in a high turnout election came out and said it was a major priority for our community to not be incarcerating people simply because they're in crisis. Um, and so it's really troubling to see beds closing and I, I'm, I appreciate the, the information that Ms. Claiborne presented today. Um, I'm still not really sure if I understand how you can close beds and keep the service at the same level. Um, our organization actually sees this as a vital resource for our community. It's incredibly necessary to provide these supports. Uh, we would actually like to see this, <laughs> this program expanded a great deal. Um, we have a need. Um, we do not want to see this um, turn into something that's going to further uh, shut down access to these services. And we definitely do not want to see people ending up in East Baton Rouge Parish Prison simply because they are having a challenging point of time in their life when they need access to care, you know, not, not incarceration. And so um, I know that this item is just for information only this evening, but I'm encouraging this council to really, really, let's take this seriously. And you have organizations like ours who are a resource, who are filled with people who are impacted, who are, have experience with this very issue. And um, I think it's time that we bring uh, the public to the table and let's really talk about how can we not only sustain the Bridge Center, but grow it into something that's uh, long lasting and serving enough people so that folks aren't ending up in that jail unnecessarily. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else here wishing to speak on item 108? Anyone else wishing to speak on item 108? We now go to council members. Council member Hurst. Hey, so uh, I was a person that beat the pavement and uh, went door to door putting out signs in support of the bridge agency. Uh, I experienced a kid that I coached who was a manic depressive and was built like LeBron James, but was 14 years old and police didn't know how to handle him. So they were treating him like an adult, locking him up when it was really just a mental health issue. So I, I say that disclaimer to say that I support where you are. Um, I'm actually working with the sheriff and the, the chief on some same mental health stuff and uh, ways to deter. But I do have some questions because my job here is to protect the taxpayers and when you have, I don't, don't know the exact number, I believe it was 16 and 16, is that correct on the beds? All right, so so it's about five point whatever million that go towards that on an annual basis, but we have 31 parishes that are being represented. My question is, and I'm only asking this because I'm working with the police force to create something called a mental health officer, trying to shape what that looks like. So, how many beds are being consumed by somebody outside of the parish when somebody inside the parish needs those beds? And, and that goes back to what Reverend Anderson was saying, which means the only next option is either to let them go or put them in jail. So, Charlotte, do you mind coming to the mic and answering that for me, please? That'd be great, thanks. And by the way, thank you for taking my phone call and kind of giving me an update on this stuff. Yeah.
Okay. Okay. Yeah, hi, how are you? Uh, so I appreciate the question. Look, I, I think one thing we want to be clear about is no one has been turned away. There's no such thing as full. And I think part of it is understanding the design. So the design is a unique one here in Louisiana. The license that we have is license 0001. So it is the first. At the same time, this design for services is the national best practice as published by our Substance Abuse Mental Health Service Administration in 2020. I know that because I was the lead writer of those best practices. And it's designed for this thing, like you described, the 16 chairs, the receiving center, is one that the answer is never no, which is why you have a chair that will create flow. There was another reasonable question that was brought up to me, which is, well, how do you reduce some of the beds and say you get the same thing? So, so I do want to talk through both of those a little bit because they're tied together. Uh, so the answer is, in this receiving center, everyone comes in, we take everyone, and it includes those from law enforcement. The, the answer is never going to be no. But we create flow. So those that need longer periods of time, they can go into that 16-bed unit for mental health services. However, for those that really need extended services like detox or they might benefit from a few more days inpatient, we're going to work with other local community providers to get them connected. Think of it a little bit like a hospital emergency department. The department's not full. Everyone can always come in. You're not bleeding too much. You don't have too much of an injury. You can get care. Uh, but on the second step for that, they're going to connect you to the appropriate beds. Could be in their facility. It could be somewhere Okay, else. and I hate to cut you off, but you're on my time, and I don't yeah, yeah. lose my time either, but that was a great answer. I normally let people talk, but I, I got a couple more questions. Gotcha. All right, so uh, when, when, the, when they're released from your care, how many go back into the homeless population? That was one of the questions. I, about 8% of that. Come to the mic if you're going to ask the question, Charlotte. I apologize. 8%. All right. So no one has ever been denied based on your beds being full? No. Okay. Because I'm going to tell you, I talked to law enforcement. They told me the complete opposite. And they may be wrong. I believe on so. On that piece of it. That, um, yeah. And so let me wait. Let me let me tell you one thing about that. Law enforcement, um, and we've had multiple conversations with them. When someone comes to the facility, we cannot get them out of the vehicle. They have to be escorted in, just like they would escort somebody into the emergency room. And so we've had multiple conversations, and I think that was part of the issue because they wanted us to get them out of the vehicle, and we cannot do that. Okay, and uh, I want to clear something up because later we talked about this, but you are the first independent crisis, but there is a model where – the hospitals have been previously used as a crisis center, correct? Not to my knowledge, I don't know. What, what was that? So, model? mental health crisis. Somebody gets has a mental health issue. They escort them to the hospitals previously. Now they can bring them to you, right? Correct. So and you're the first one in your class, but crisis intervention has been there through uh, larger healthcare facilities. All all hospitals have some, not all, but most have a crisis stabilization unit. Okay, and that brought up a question of why would you be building it differently? And we talked about that a little bit, and I thought about that afterwards. So what I wanted to do as a next step is, could we possibly get a report from the state to determine what some of the issues are? I know you said some, you had some emails, but we'd like a representative from the state to come to understand why there's a holdup and what we can do to, to possibly aid to remedy that so that you can continue to provide the care that you guys were put in, uh, in place to do. And um, I want to clear something else up for Reverend Anderson. I know you were asking for a report. I think the report is important, but if I remember correctly, you were asking for medical information, which is covered by HIPAA, right? So they cannot provide detailed information. If that was wrong, I want you to come to the mic. I'm going to give you a little bit of my time. Um, and, and, and I want you to know, I personally don't have a problem with building as you go. If somebody's not a trailblazer, then nobody else has a model to follow after. So... The only thing that I ask is that when you see something that doesn't work, you put a plan together to fix it. That doesn't mean it's going to resolve it. But if that doesn't work, then we put another plan together. And as long as you're doing that, I'm okay. Um, so, but, I, but I do want to get the information from the state to make sure that what we're responsible for to the taxpayers, we can adequately give them information that's, uh, that's spot on. So can you help us coordinate that? Yes. 
And we actually met with the state yesterday. And then I want to clarify one thing, if I may. Um, we're not building as we go. Um, the provider that we have has been doing this forever. I do think that the difference is the fact that Louisiana didn't have crisis services prior to, but they do now have crisis services implemented in the state, which happened in March of this year. So now we are aligned with the state. But it's again, it's a slow growing process because we were just a little bit ahead of the state. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. And uh, Reverend Anderson, you can have my last couple of minutes to finish your statement. And I appreciate that, Councilman. Uh, and, and forgive me if I can make a statement that I didn't make at the beginning. I want to thank uh, Tanja Miles for her service. Anytime she's in a room, I want to make sure that we honor our veterans. So I forgot to mention that. But I wanted to be clear about something. What I said was I wanted the diagnostic codes. That is not people's individual diagnoses. That is the billing code. That's a billing code. That's the same information you submit to an insurance company. What that tells us is what we're paying for. Can that be provided? The billing codes, you can come up to the mic, y'all can share. Yeah. That information was supplied to Reverend Anderson two months ago. And then we also had a meeting face to face right after. Well, just send July. it to the Metro Council. To the I email. did. Thank you. Okay. I did. But I can send it again. That'd be great. Okay. And just kind of highlight the points that we need to look at. Okay. So when we talk about billing codes, um, for clarification, you can't bill um, the Bridge Center for Hope with billing codes because they're indigent, they don't have insurance. The billing codes apply to Medicaid individuals. And so that is protected by the MCO. That is their personal information. So I can't give that information, but I can tell you about the Bridge Center for the people that we cover. So the indigent, indigent population of ones that get the five point, whatever the supplement. Gotcha. Okay. And she is absolutely correct. As, as most of you know, I've given everybody an open invitation to come see me at court at 1 p.m. every single day, Monday through Friday. And Charlotte has been wonderful and come to the Family Support Center and also sat with me in court. So as I shared with her, my concerns about this project have preexisted her role or even the foundation of this creation. But what I will say is this, the two things I asked for was for the public not for me, ask for the public. And I ask every report to build on the last report so that there is a baseline. When I come before you and I tell you how many deaths we have in the jail, I give you a date baseline. And then I tell you that as of today, we have 59 deaths so that you know where I'm starting and you know where I'm ending. And that's the information I've been asking for is that the citizens of the parish deserve that information, but they also deserve something that is kissed, quite frankly. It's our money and all of us should be able to understand what we are looking at from year to year to year. And I'll leave you with this. Our library is fabulous, but you can read their reports. They're written in English. And I don't think we should ask anybody for less than that, that the citizens be able to understand what is being presented and that it be in the same format every single time. One of the commitments was that Reverend the Bridge Reverend Center Anderson. would report quarterly. Reverend and Anderson, so that's Patrick, what I'm asking it. for. All right. Council Member Banks. So um, the reason, one of the reasons that I'm not um, particularly hard on Charlotte is because of just like Reverend Anderson stated, the foundation was messed up. And I did not support um, this item. So the last council actually, um, this was a project that was um, initiated by the Baton Rouge Area Foundation. And um, the model that was presented to us was a mental health model out of San Antonio. And so the council members and all, and uh, the previous mayor, we all went to San Antonio to, um, to go over the facilities, to go over the project. And the way it was set up in San Antonio, first of all, was for all mental health, from children to adults. That's the first thing. 
The second thing is, it was not just for um, persons that were entering uh, through law enforcement, but because they had it situated where the, the mental health part was almost connected to the jail. So I was around the corner or something, but it, it was a facility that any mental health person, the company would service, but they have a particular part that law enforcement dealt with. That was the model that was sent. That was the model that this tax was campaigned upon. However, in no time was that the real deal. The person who ran that San Antonio model was from Baton Rouge, Southern Lab graduate, Southern University graduate, Laws thing. She was offered the job to come here to run the program. She did not accept it because of the way this program it was set up, because it did not include um, all ages, because it was basically as, um, and I don't want to quote her, but it was almost like, this is all about money. This is not about helping people. And, and she, did not, she didn't accept a job. This to have, when we, we talk about, um, and I must say, the program that most, that is most connected to the way it's supposed to run would be Capital Area Human Service District. And I brought that up then because of the fact that they have, that's where these taxes should have been gone. There should have been a mental health crisis team that is connected to Capital Area Human Service District. They had, for one thing, they dealt with the whole capital area. And so you have East Baton Rouge Parish supposedly paying for services, but in the initiation of it, it's always has said they would take people from Livingston, from Ascension, and from the other parishes. From day one, they've been saying that. Now, I don't know what the data is, but it was very much part of our conversation um, during those times that I objected to the fact that we were going to be taking people from other parishes on our dollar. So, you know, when you, we, we, uh, a house cannot build on that kind of shaky foundation. And I don't blame Charlotte. I'm sorry she's in a position, but I don't think it's ever going to work to tell you the truth with fidelity. You know, um, I would like, I, one of the things one of the council members said is that we are not afraid to go back and do it, do it another way. And I wish Tondra Miles, who's I think a board here and has spent many years as a consultant, would um, facilitate the possibility of us adding this program under Capital Area Human Service District. Because that, for one thing, you don't start a mental health uh, pro program just like you wouldn't do one for primary care with underserved members and not have your mental health papers, to, I mean, your uh, Medicaid and Medicare papers together. That's crazy. That's a part of a third of the income that you're just shooing away in the wind. And that does not make sense. We have uh, federal health care, uh, I always get the name, FHQC, whatever. All of, we have five in this parish. They all started out, before that was um, Affordable Care Act, they all started off dealing with the homeless population, the uninsured, time, um, and, sure, and the underinsured. So that, this is not new. But the problem is the methodology is because it was about paying a private company. And that is where all the money is going to. Anytime we privatize this way, and especially when you have a system in place that works, and Capital Area does a fine job, but they've been short of being able to read. They're still trying to reach these same people, which they could have been adding their, their funding source and their model to this. All, $6 million would have done a great job adding it to the Capital Area who probably have these same people Medicaid and Medicare numbers that they, that um, the Bridge City doesn't have access because we serve them, they serve the same population. Probably been serving them since they were in kindergarten and high school and, and college and all that. 
So it, it does not work. And I do challenge um, the board with uh, the Bridge Center of Hope and the Capital Area Human Service District to get together and determine how they can work together to increase the income, increase the flow. I hate, I, I don't mean, I'm, I'm sorry you about to, you know, I would, I would like you to be unemployed in Baton Rouge, but th that middleman, that private part needs to be taken out. And it needs to be between, it needs to be on the Capital Area Human Service District. Thank you, Council Member Hudson. Um, Charlotte, or it could possibly be the gentleman from RI International. I had a couple of questions um, for you guys, if y'all can come back up. Um, so I know we've, we've talked a lot about um, the Medicaid piece, and, and, and in the past we talked about that really was the financial model that this tax was sold to the public on. You touched on a couple of items. Uh, one was the inability to access the Medicaid portal. And I'm assuming you're meaning that was RI International was unable. So. Walk me through that process. Why, why was that such a burden? I mean, I guess it, as I assume that portal is available to any providers, why was there a, a, an no. inability to, to access it? So what happens with the Medicaid portal is you have to do an um, application, and that application has a list of provider types. The license that we have is a CRC, which is a crisis receiving center, um, a behavioral health service provider, and a home and community-based service license. We have three. Two of those licenses do not have a provider type. So therefore, because there's no provider type, you have to contract directly with the MCOs. You can't fill out that Medicaid packet. So once you contract with the MCOs, then it goes through their system, and then you're assigned a provider type, and then that way you can get access to the portal. So MCO. Managed care organization. The Medicaid managed care organizations, that's your Aetna, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, I mean Blue Shield, um, Aetna, United, Louisiana Healthcare Connection, those. So for the crisis receiving center, because it doesn't have a provider type, you have to contract with the, the managed care organization first. Once you contract with them and bill, then it goes through their system the back way, and then they're, they give you a, a Medicaid provider number, and then with that number, you can get into the system. So the issue with that is the contracts with the managed care organizations did not take place until this year because, again, like I stated, there was no Medicaid funding or rates for crisis services until this year. Okay, so that brings, my, mm -hmm. brings me to my next question. Um, those crisis services through Medicaid, I'm assuming that those are the same across the entire country. Is that not the case? Are we Are we – being reimbursed a different rate in Louisiana than, say, Texas, absolutely. which is the model that was built on? 100% absolutely, that is correct. We are being different. The um, crisis service rates average between $900 and $1,200. Um, if you look at the national best standards or uh, other locations or other states that have the same model or similar models to the one that the, what, then what the Bushner has. And so those rates are between $900 and $1,200 per day. Um, the rates that Louisiana has is $470 dollars to six hundred and sixty four dollars all right so why when i find out no so when um louisiana started doing their crisis services they i believe they talked to an actuary and that's what those rates came to be and that's what we're having those conversations with the department to try to get those rates increased to be able to cover the cost of care of crisis services so, so let me let me ask this when ldh sends this data or sends the bill back up to Medicaid, are, are they recouping some costs there or, or Wait, uh, are, are they being reimbursed for that full national average? Uh, no. No? No. So it, it might be good for us to have some questions posed to the folks from LDH as well, I guess, in this regard, right? Yes. Thanks. Council member Rob. Okay. So a couple of years ago or a year ago, we were on a Zoom call. And I asked the question, have we contracted with, do we have rates set by Blue Cross Blue Shield, Humana, any of those folks? And the answer was no. And that was a red flag to me. If any of us went to our healthcare provider now, you would get a summary of benefits in the mail and it would say, the pediatrician charged $150 and Blue Cross Blue Shield reimbursed at $80. 
So that pediatrician knows how to run his business based on those reimbursement rates set by those health carrier providers. Okay, so those numbers are accessible and are available. We just had recent litigation and legislation that came before the state of Louisiana that now requires healthcare providers to provide that information and what those rates are. So for example, Our Lady of the Lake Hospital or Women's Hospital, they cannot say, Blue Cross Blue Shield cannot say, I'm gonna reimburse your doctors at $90 an hour or a visit. And then they're gonna say to women's, I'm gonna reimburse your doctors at $75 a visit. And those, those contracts are not shown amongst one another. So the fact that we have this facility and we're this far in and we don't have that basic reimbursement information that is so easily obtainable is absolutely a red flag to me and I believe it should be a red flag to everyone sitting in here tonight. The other issue that we have is the Medicaid portal. Okay, when we're talking about Medicaid rates, if you look to insurance in the state of Louisiana, what me Medicaid reimbursements look like, they're absolutely set by an actuary. But those rates are have been within the state of Louisiana governed and are accessible. And a business plan, someone who's making a model and a business plan can obtain those rates to see what the rate of reimbursement is to make sure they're within the proper financial model to run their business. It happens with hospitals, it happens with doctors, it happens with dentists, it happens with eye doctors. It's, it's nothing new. So again, years later, I sit here before you and I say, what's happening? Where are we at? We can call the heads of Blue Cross Blue Shield as soon as we walk out of this meeting, get a meeting with them and ask them what's going on. We can call Humana and ask them the same thing. They're based here in Baton Rouge. We can go and find them. We have an asterisk right here that says Humana donated $40,000. So while we were taking their check for the $40,000, we couldn't have a sidebar with them and ask them what the rates were? Just my two cents. Thank you. Is there any other council member wishing to speak on item 108? Thank you for the report. Council members, oh, Council Member Moke, you want to speak? Go ahead. Got to be quick on the draw. I was trying to pull up the talk button. Um, so you're saying, y'all are saying that y'all are providing the same services. Are you providing the same amount of people for the services? So what I'm asking is, <clears throat> we keep talking about the... Uh, you've said it over and over. You, you're providing the same services. You're not going to drop any services. You can come on up to the mic. Either one of y'all, both of y'all. But in providing those same services, are you going to be able to still provide the same amount, you know, same amount of services to the same amount of people? Okay, I, I think I, I understand your question. Um, so you're asking the differences between the occupancy of the building and the services that we are providing. And so as um, Charlotte said, we are providing the same services in the building. So the same substance use and mental health services are still available within the building. Um, however, on the slide, she showed that we are decreasing um, by 16 beds. Um, so what that means is that um, when individuals present to the facility, we have a no wrong door policy. So individuals can come in at any point in time, and that's not going to change. Um, in August, we saw 354 individuals, and they all came into that same first unit, and that first unit will remain the same. Um, what happens uh, afterwards is that we have now uh, 16 longer term um, beds within the facility that we will then transition individuals to if they need to, but we will also have to transition individuals um, to other providers in the area who also provide uh, the um, services um, so that individuals can be uh, supported. And then there's a subset of individuals who won't need longer term um, care that we will then connect back to the community. So the answer is that that front door remains exactly the same. Yeah. However, we will have to work um, with our community providers for the for the individuals that need longer term care. So, so it sounds to me like y'all are going to check them in and then ship them out to another facility. Is, is the basic nutshell of that, instead of staying at the facility? 
No, that's that, that's not what well, I, I mean, said. I, I feel like that's what you just told me was that the same door mm -hmm. and the same intake will be there and the same amount of people can come through that front door. But where they go after that front door, that's what's decreasing so, uh, in that facility. Mm -hmm. They will go somewhere. They will go somewhere else and then we'll pay to, to pay, take care of that other facility, I guess, wherever they go. So we will have the, the same 16 bed unit that, that, that we have had throughout the process that we will transition individuals into. Um, if someone needs a longer term stay and we are not able to care for them in that 16 bed unit there, then we will have to rely on our community partners. But that isn't anything that is new. Um, we have been connecting individuals to community partners, whether that is after our 16 bed unit, whether that is before our 16 bed unit, it is creating that flow um, to ensure that we're able to make sure that the individuals that come to the facility uh, get, get the care that they need. And sometimes okay, well, that's not within the facility. Sometimes we do have to utilize our, our community partners. Okay, thank you. It just sounds like we're gonna be doing it some more. So one of the things that was brought up also, 19% is from out of parish, correct? Did you mention that in your presentation? So that 19% coming from out of parish, is that directly brought from outside the parish or is that people that were just either picked up in East Baton Rouge Parish and they just happen to have an address outside of the parish? A combination of both. Combination of both. Mm -hmm. What's the percentages that we're bringing directly out of the parish into East Baton Rouge Parish? What I mean, you trying to, by law enforcement or? So by... if I'm from Livingston Parish, mm -hmm. And I'm driving down to the 1012 split, mm -hmm. and I have a mental breakdown on the side of the interstate. Am I considered from Livingston Parish, or am I East Baton Rouge Parish because it happened at the 1012 split? You are considered a Livingston Parish resident. Okay. So, and you're coming to give a start. Same thing as okay. if you were to go to the emergency so that, room. That's my question as far okay. as percentage and wanting to know. Mm -hmm. How many people are already having a mental breakdown at Juven in the interstate and brought to this facility? That's what I mean by directly outside of the parish. How, what's our percentage of people brought from outside of the parish to this facility? So on the chart, let's see. I can't see that. You want to so the time, council member? Yes, please. Quick question. Are we talking about uninsured or just in general out the just parish? In gen in just general, in general. Pe people from outside the parish that are brought from outside the parish, Ascension, uh, uh, West Feliciana, um, Livingston. I have that number. Give me one West second. Baton Rouge. Waiting on my computer. Here we go. One second. 14%. Okay. So that, that hard number of 14% is 572 individuals out of the 4,374 okay. since the facility is open. All right. So because we're the first in the state, that's why they're being brought in? Well, I mean, they're only in the state or I mean, I'm just trying we, to figure when out when you we, say brought in. I'm, I'm trying to understand when you say why, why, why are they being brought in from outside of the parish? Who are they to being the brought by? What's that? I'm saying you're saying brought in because the way it works is like 51 percent of the individuals come in on their own and then the remaining can come in by law enforcement. So if law enforcement encounters someone like you and you from Livingston, but you're in East Baton Rouge Parish, that's considered you're in EBR custody. Understood. Yeah, but. It's somebody from East Baton Rouge Parish going to, and I, and I keep using Living, so I'll use West Baton Rouge, so I'll jump to a different one. It's somebody from East Baton Rouge Parish going to West Baton Rouge Parish, picking someone up and bringing them back to the facility. I would not know that information because when people come in, we, they, we take everyone in that's in crisis. So we're not saying if you're coming in, think about this, I'm sorry, that would be considered a self somebody's coming in on their own, okay. um, or that would be considered a family or friend. That's gotcha. that 11%. Okay, so 
possibly some of this 14% are just coming on their own from outside of the parish. Possibly. They're not doing what? Okay. They could, I mean, that 14% could also account for people coming in for first responders as well. The, see, that's where I'm wondering why are our East Baton Rouge Parish first responders or outside first responders? Well, the only reason why they will be bringing them because they will be in the parish. Like, for example, if okay, they're... Okay, well, that's an in-parish thing then. Yes, but they're still... But even though they're in parish, when we get your address, you you might have a living And, and that, that's why I was looking for the breakdown. Yes. And, and I know that I'm dragging this out or whatever, yeah. but that's a big question that a lot of the public bring up is why are we have an East Baton Rouge Parish tax-funded thing that we are bringing people from... Purpose bringing people from outside of East Baton Rouge Parish. I get it. If I'm from Livingston and something happens to me at the 1012 split in East Baton Rouge Parish, and y'all figure I have a mental breakdown in East Baton Rouge Parish, I can go to the facility. I get it, and my address still might be Livingston. Correct. But a lot of people are assuming, or whatever you want to work with that with, that something's happening to me outside of East Baton Rouge Parish, and somebody goes, Law enforcement or whatever, hey, let's go get them or let's, you know, let's take them to this facility from outside the parish. I'm not talking, I'm not just talking about the ones that are bringing themselves. I'm wondering if any of our agencies are going to get no. these people from outside of the parish Absolutely and bringing not. them into the, no. thank you. Nope. That's where I was trying to get to. No. Um, have we laid off 21 people? At Has the facility? Who, uh, no, there, have we, the bridge center or have or I laid off? Has 21 people been laid off at work from working at that facility? Yes, out of the 140. So now they're down to a uh, staff of 120. Okay, thank you. Okay. Councilmember Amorosa. Yeah, Charlotte, real quick. Sorry, to expound on what he was talking about because he asked most of my questions. Um, so the ones that are, that live outside the parish, is that private insurance? Is that Medicaid? What is that? That's, How is that being paid? We're surely not funding we're, that. The Bridge Center for Hope is not funding that. The taxpayers are not funding out-of-parish residents at okay. all. So, so those individuals, um, a majority of them do have insurance. Um, there is a small, pop, there's a small, uh, I think 11% of those that do not have insurance and they're uninsured. But that's still not something that the Bridge Center for Hope covers that RI absorbs that cost. Okay. Okay, thank you. Council Member Adams. Charlotte, what is the average daily census at the Bridge Center? What's the average daily census? 38. 38, okay. yes. And so, but you said there's 16 beds, right? I'm, I'm, I guess I'm confused. Well, so that oh, average. You had more. The average census, um, that 16, that decrease happened actually yesterday. So we won't have that, those numbers. So everything that the census numbers is for when we had um, 48. Okay. Okay. So you have had 48. And then, and so uh, you said the average daily census of 36. You said 30, 38? 38. 38. Okay. And so now 16 beds are gone away. So. There isn't there there isn't enough space to meet the average daily census. Yes. Okay. Um, I'm going to yield the rest of my time to um, Councilman Hurst. What she really did was throw an alley oop because that was actually my question that came about through other discussion is that if we have less beds but we have the same need, how are you able to properly service the people that are coming into that facility? Yep. Yeah, and so, but even when you outsource them. Um, and I get you've been doing that. So the open door policy is there. And is it a stabilization? Kind of walk me through that process. Beds are full at this point. It's an open door policy. But what does that mean for somebody that you really need to treat? Because I, I heard open door and answer my question earlier, but I thought about what is the impact of somebody who needs to be there? You are obviously going to do it from an intake standpoint. But what's the next step when the beds are full? And are they providing the type of service that you would provide 
from a stabilization standpoint, or would they do better in the hospital? So the, the Bridge Center for Hope, again, is a stabilization, a crisis receiving center. So our license is a lot different from a hospital or an inpatient facility in the sense that there is a time limit that you can even be in the facility. The um, maximum, according to the license, is seven days, whereas with a hospital and a freestanding clinic is 15 days. So what we've always done is when someone comes to the facility, if they need a longer stay than past that seven days, we've always worked with the community partners to be able to transfer them either to a, a freestanding mental health hospital or to a hospital if their acuity level just is not where it needs to be after those seven days. So basically what we're doing now is, is just the same process as before. So we're not going to turn anybody away. So I'm talking about people under seven days that are within your policy that walk to your door and the beds are full because now we reduce beds. So they do a capacity plan every single day, all day, throughout the day to make sure that the, the facility doesn't get to a point where they're at capacity because with law enforcement, it's 100% of the time and you never know when they're coming. And then the last question is, does that mean that we end up fast tracking people out of there that need more time? Fast tracking to go where? We're, if we're not fast tracking out of the facility or fast tracking them to the, to the streets? To the streets or to another facility based on you having a high occupancy level and, and less beds? No. And the reason why I'm transferring is because this is operational questions, so it's best to let the operations people speak on it. Yeah, so, so, so you're right about, I, I don't know if fast track is the right word, but there are individuals that we would serve that would have a longer length of stay in our detox unit or other, but they, they could be there six days. Uh, those are individuals that we verify they have insurance and coverage, and we get them connected to a provider that could serve them for those six days. It's particularly those longer lengths of stay where we would look at transferring them. The, the fast tracking, the concern in that language for me is it, it would suggest someone's not quite ready to get out and get back to wherever they are in the community, but you do it because you're running out of space. That's, that is not how we operate. And I, I'll tell you, we operate more crisis facilities than any organization in the country as a not-for-profit. Uh, we have operations in nine states. We do know how to do this. And so that kind of flow that you're describing has to be done each day from our program. So we, we do know how, but, but you are correct to say, look, you can't, you can't take away 16 beds and say everything's the same. It's, it's not the same. Uh, you're going to have to do something. Our lengths of stay aren't going to change because if a person needs it, they need it. What would change is those people that are needing those five and six day length of stays, we'd be working to secure them beds as we see the acuity on day one. We'd start getting them over there. And when you do just a few of those with the longer lengths of stay, you can imagine our 38 individual census quickly enough uh, can drop down if six of those individuals in a week. Okay, final forward. question. In, yeah. in, in, indigent people, the people that don't have Medicaid that can't yeah. go to these other facilities, if we have 16 of those in the bed, and they don't have, are there other facilities that focus on indigent people yeah, no, that no, have mental health issues? No, sir. I think they're the ones that will be staying with us, right? That's, that's the kind of math we have to do everywhere. There are always those that we have that don't have coverage. That's true in every state. And we do non-Medicaid expansion states where that's an even bigger issue. And so when we don't have it, uh, those are the ones that end up staying with us because we got to make sure they continue to get care. And that's really the commitment we've had. And I think you've all seen. we. We're there. We've accepted losing money to make sure we can make a difference in this community, and that's what we're here to do. Council Member Godet. Thank you, Charlotte. If you wouldn't mind coming up. Charlotte, thanks for providing the information. Um, you are meeting with decision makers at LDH? We did yesterday. Is there a timeline on resolving the issue that is the core of the, the problem here? We are meeting back with them within a week. Um, they're taking all of the information that was given to them and they're reassessing the situation. So we, we have one in our mind, but we need to wait to see what they're gonna tell us in a week. But some of the, um, one of the main issues, which was the portal was resolved today. Okay, the access was provided. Yes, that's, that was, that was that granted today. That doesn't equal reimbursement. No, it does not. Okay, and which is the ultimate Correct. goal here. Yes. Um, I think it would be prudent if we as a council put this report back on the agenda in a month, October okay. 26th. I think this is an opportunity for you to provide unfiltered, unedited information to the community. And so I, you know, I do that as a measure of come back with hopefully some updates on the progress of those meetings and where things stand. Um, so I would offer that up, Mayor Pro Tem, as something we should submit for a follow-up in one month uh, on this item, an additional report. Okay. 
uh, council member no charlotte uh just a quick question on on the uh the layoffs uh, once these issues are resolved uh, and it sounds like y'all are working towards them is there an intention to ramp back up and rehire these individuals absolutely has that discussion been had with them is that uh, absolutely that's that is the, that is the intent and and do you anticipate or do you have an anticipation of the timeline to work out the issues to come to that end? So here's the thing. We try to be proactive um, as a board way back in 2019 to secure rates. Um, we had all these conversations with Louisiana Department of Health, the uh, Medicaid departments, everything, even the MCOs. We had all of these conversations well in advance before the facility even broke ground. And what we were told was to wait until our provider had a license before they can start talking about contract negotiations. And you all have that report that I sent via email. The, the problem came in where because there, was no, there wasn't any crisis services, you had to do what it, which is called in a lieu of services, finding rates and services that are comparable to what we were already providing to be able to contract with. And then Louisiana Department of Health um, implemented their own crisis plan about started implementing their own crisis plan. So we got caught up in that, them trying to start their own with us trying to get Lewis services, but we had already started providing those services. And so there was a seven month lag between us doing a Lewis service document and before that document actually got approved. And that wasn't until September, but by that time, the department issued a RFA, a request for application across the state for crisis providers. And that was a lot different from what we were doing because then it went from being a one parish to having to do a region. And so that's where those seven um, parishes come in because in order to be able to be licensed to be reimbursed for crisis services, you had to agree to the rates that they had already implemented, which meant we could no longer negotiate rates. Um, two, that also meant that you had to be able to serve all seven parishes. So that no longer allowed us to be just exclusive to East Baton Rouge Parish. And then it also um, made the rates not effective until 2022. So again, it, it wasn't that. So the business plan and the pro forma were, all of, were based off of something that changed. Absolutely. I mean, it did a complete 360. Okay. Or 180. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm right. You're right. I'm sorry. A 180. <laughs> thank you. It's still flipping. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Councilmember Hudson. Uh, Charlie, you, you just talked about with Councilman Godet uh, that y'all just resolved the Medicaid portal issue yesterday. So Today. Today. Okay. So the Medicaid reimbursements that we've had so far have only been done through that in lieu of services agreement? Um, no. The in lieu of service covers the crisis stabilization because that those rates do not go in effect until 20, um, January of 2023. So the way that the department set it up, there is... Um, the, there's two array, it's four array of services, but three of them went into effect on March of this year. And then the crisis services won't go in effect until January. So we're operating off on a lieu of service for the crisis stabilization piece. So, so let me ask it this way. Any, anything that would have normally been billed through, to Medicaid through the portal has not been reimbursed yet then, is that, is that correct? So the portal is not the, the way to build Medicaid. The portal gives um, the provider access to see who their Medicaid provider is, and it also gives background information. What happens is when you don't have access to the portal, a lot of those services you have to do prior authorization for. And so if they can't look to see who the provider is, they can't look to see who to get a prior authorization for. Um, up until about three months, what they were doing was calling the 1-800 Medicaid number and getting information that way, but they only allowed them to do that three at a time. And when you're serving thousands of individuals or people coming in throughout the day, that gets that long, that long, that list gets a little lengthy. Plus, they close at four o'clock. So from Friday at four o'clock to Monday, you have no access to be able to see who's what services they have, because again, these people are in crisis. So what happens on Monday, you have a backlog and then you're making calls. And so some of your claims are getting denied because one, you didn't get prior authorization because you didn't have access to it. So now 
they have access and the ability to be able to see who their provider is, to be able to do that prior authorization and so forth. And then that will allow them to be able to get bill, be able to do their billing um, a little bit easier. So, that, so the access to the portal that you got today is going to significantly increase your ability to be reimbursed from Medicaid. Is that safe to say? It's safe to say it would be it, not reimbursed, but to bill. To bill. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions from council members on item 108? Thank you, Charlotte, for the report. Council members, if you now go back to page nine, we're going to take item 56.